Fire and wind come from the sky, from the gods in the sky. But Krom is your god. Krom, and he lives in the earth. Once giants lived in the earth, Conan. And in the darkness of chaos they fooled Krom, and they took from him the enigma of steel. Krom was angered, and the earth shook, and fire and wind struck down these giants, and threw their bodies into the waters. But in their rage the gods forgot the secret of steel, and left it on the battlefield. We, who found it, are just men. Not gods, not giants, just men. And the secret of steel has always carried with it a mystery. You must learn its riddle, Conan. You must learn its discipline. For no one, no one in this world you can trust. Not men, not women, not beasts. Steel. This you can trust. If you make yourself more than just a man, if you devote yourself to an idea, if they can stop you, then you become something else entirely. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mildred, and I will be your gaming monk for the evening. It could be argued that I'm biased against magic systems and RPGs. It's not entirely true, but I will admit it's an attitude based on a response to how certain fantasy games have treated it. Mainly, my experiences with Dungeons and Dragons, except for the version everyone besides me hates, but I digress. As someone who grew up with innumerable action works, from samurai flicks to 80s gunfests, it always frustrated me that the breadth of martial styles and approaches would get reduced to a single die roll where magic users get dozens of pages describing the minutia of their magical effects, with 3rd edition D&D being one of the worst offenders. Naturally, I would gravitate towards games that gave deeper treatments to non-magical combat, several of which I've already reviewed. It was this attitude that led me to a game endorsed by the Renaissance Martial Arts Association, The Riddle of Steel. Riddle of Steel is a fine game, but we will not be covering it here. As the title suggests, we'll be looking at its spiritual successors, Blade of the Iron Throne and Song of Swords, both aiming to roleplay with steel in hand and fantasy at a lower tier. How does each hold up? Let's find out. We'll start with Blade of the Iron Throne, which I'm going to call Blade from here on in for the sake of my own sanity. If it wasn't obvious enough already, Blade leads heavily towards the sword and sorcery end of the equation. Wearing this influence on its sleeve, my primary issue is the same I've had in other games, a lack of visual identity beyond just sword and sorcery. This game's identity and style comes more from the text and the page representation than the artwork, which is good but all over the place, and heavily borrowed. Furthermore, I think a few diagrams or some spacing could be a great help in the game's crunchier aspects, as the book's flow feels a bit scrunched. On the plus side, it builds both a glossary and an index. Song of Swords, on the other hand, looks far more professional in its 245 pages. It's a slightly smaller affair than Blade, but the focus is less on sword and sorcery and more on historical affairs, with a magical book that's meant to be coming later, but at the time of this recording, isn't out. Artwork has a much stronger sense of cohesion and presents far better spacing in its writing. Moreover, it's far more liberal with diagrams and presentation, so I didn't have to do as much double-checking. Also, its glossary counts as its index. Now, given its inspirations, one would naturally expect a heavy amount of crunch in character creation. We'll be exploring this in both games through our traveling swordsman, Valorix. Blade has a priority system, rating several aspects with a grade from A to F. Obviously, only one aspect can have each grade, making for some tough decisions. In order from highest to lowest, we have Proficiency A, Attributes B, Skills C, Culture D, Assets E, and Sorcery F. This determines what we can spend at each step. First is Attributes, of which we have 29 points to spend between 6 attributes, with no attribute above 9. We'll be going with Brawn 5, Daring 5, Tenacity 6, Sagacity 3, Heart 5, and Cunning 4. This also determines our derived attributes as Reflex 5, Aim 4, Knockdown 5, Knockout 6, and Move 7. Second is Skills, which we have 24 points to spend on. Much like attributes, no skill can go above 9. In our case, we'll go with 6 points each on Tracking, Soldiering, Survival, and Battlefield Tactics. Third is Proficiencies, which determines the available pools of maneuvers and general skill in arms. 
We have 16 points to spend in this regard, and we'll be putting this into Longsword and Greatsword at 8 each, granting us a maneuver pool of 13. Fourth is Sorcery, which we have at Doomed. Because of this, we not only cannot use magic, but are susceptible to its usage against us. Fifth is Assets, which are positive or negative quirks the character has. In our case, we have to choose one poor aspect, which will be Dreaded. Lastly, Culture. And since our culture is listed as civilized, we don't gain any cultural modifiers, positive or negative. While I like the priority system, there's a few little details that are omitted that bug me. For one, I think the passion attributes need some expansion, or at least a demonstration on what makes good passion entries and what doesn't. As it is, it's a little undercooked. Furthermore, equipment acquisition is barely acknowledged, meaning that'd be a case of fill in the blanks. It's not bad per se, just a little incomplete and relying on some assumptions. Character creation in Song of Swords also uses a priority mechanic, but not exactly the same way. Instead of ranking priorities from A to F, you spend player creation points based on the tier of fantasy the campaign is going for. In our case, we're going to go with Heroic Fantasy, which starts us with 22 PCP and a category cap of 7. In this regard, we'll spend 1 on race, 4 on attributes, 4 on skills, 5 on schools and proficiency points, and 4 on boons. For the first part, race, we're at a tier 1 race, meaning human. This grants us the flaw arc and the willing to learn abilities. Secondly, attributes, in which we have 27 points to distribute among the 8 core attributes. We'll be putting 5 in strength, 4 in agility, 5 in endurance, 4 in health, 4 in willpower, 4 in wits, 5 in perception, and 4 in intelligence. This generates the following derived attributes. Adroitness 4, Mobility 7, Carry 10, Charisma 6, and Toughness 4, as well as Strength Damage Bonus 2 and Grit 2. Third is Skills. We have 15 points to spend here, alongside 4 more from Intelligence. We'll put 4 in Athletics, Drill, Tactics, and Strategy, and 3 in Writing. Fourth is Schools and Proficiencies, which determines the fighting style we'll be taking advantage of. We have 12 points to spend in this regard. Due to the Willing to Learn ability, we automatically learn the max proficiencies for a given school. We'll be going with Soldier at rank 8, so we'll be proficient in Pugilism, 1 and 2 handed swords, blunt weapons, spears, pole arms, daggers, and crossbows, as well as firearms. Furthermore, as we're rank 8, we have access to 2 superior maneuvers and 3 talents. We'll go with the superior versions of Push Cut and Break and the first talents in the Weapon Primacy, Swift Sword, and Momentum chains. Fifth is Social Class, which is technically optional. In our case, we're a Freeman, which grants us a Wealth Level of 1 and 25 GP. We'll spend this on a Zweihander, a Bastard Sword, Half Plate Armor, a Traveling Cloak, Urban Attire, a Destrier, and 4 weeks worth of rations, leaving us with 5 GP and 12 SP. Sixth is Boons. And while we don't have points from PCP to spend on boons or banes, we do have two from our choice of social class. Hale and Hardy rank 2, and Literate 1. The final part is arcs, which are the short and long-term goal seeds for the character. This is divided into the saga arc shared by the party, the epic arc, which is the character's personal goal, the belief arc, which is their core virtue, the praise-defining glory arc, and in the case of humans, the impulse-based flaw arc. Respectively, we'll go with Establish a New Nation, Become a Master at Arms, Respect, Achieve Glory in War, and Disquieting for each arc. The arcs determine what behaviors trigger the awarding of arc points, Song of Swords equivalent to experience. Song of Swords does appear to be more flexible than Blade, and most interestingly, magic is not a factor if you don't wish to use it. I only had a few cases of double-checking, and in the majority of instances, everything I needed could be clearly looked up. The only nitpick to come is the differing costs on aspects could be a bit messy since it's not always one-to-one. -one. Even with that nitpick to end all nitpicks, nothing was a mystery to me in this. Blade uses a d12 dice pool. When making a check, you'd roll the relevant value in d12 and count any die over a target number as a success. By default, this is a 7. This is compared to how many successes are needed to pass. Drama points might appear to be Blade's extra effort mechanic, but it is more accurately described as an edit button the players have, opposite compilations on the GM's side since they can be used to throw narrative monkey wrenches into the scene. 
Given its inspirations, the combat system is intended to allow for complex maneuvers. This starts with the limelight mechanic in turn order. Because much of the combat is meant to be cinematically theater of the mind, for lack of a better term, the limelight is when one or multiple participants have the focus on them. This is described as akin to a film focusing on one engagement, as opposed to everything else going on in a given scene. When the limelight is on two participants in combat, this is referred to as an exchange. Exchanges start out with one side being declared as the aggressor or defender, sometimes through a contested reflex role if both intend to be the aggressor. Following that, the aggressor may make an offensive maneuver with the defender making a defensive one, allocating a number of dice from their maneuver pool to do so. Once both sides have picked, they roll their appropriate number of dice with their respective weapons or shields, determining the target numbers for the roll. Regardless, this is a contested roll with excess successes on the attacker's side granting extra raw damage. This raw damage is reduced by armor to determine a wound level, targeting a body part determined by a d6 roll. The process repeats until a pause happens or someone interrupts the exchange with a drama point. Sorcery works in a somewhat similar manner, with sorceress mysteries working akin to martial proficiencies. However, it adds an additional derived attribute in the form of power, which is the sum of the mage's total mysteries, plus sagacity, tenacity, and brawn, divided by three. This sum of power, plus a mystery's rating, determines the sorcery pool available for given spells. The pool is then split between casting and containment. The first is rolled to determine if you successfully cast, and the second is to contain the backlash from the spell's energies. Failing the containment check can result in immediate complications as well as taint. Taint applies a penalty to your spell pool and non-hostile interaction rolls. Blade of the Iron Throne's mechanics can appear intimidating at first, but this is a case of presentation more than anything else. A few diagrams or charts, especially regarding what maneuvers are unlocked at certain proficiency levels, could certainly help give a quick summary of certain mechanics. However, the sticking point is doubtless going to be the maneuver list. I feel like the game is designed to use man the maneuver card add-on instead of being an optional thing. I don't have a problem with that personally, but I'd probably write some cliff notes for my players beforehand. Song of Swords uses a similar dice pool system to Blade, but uses d10s instead of d12s. Similarly, Luck acts as an extra effort mechanic, but instead of being a player's edit button, there's more defined tactical advantages in Luck usage to add dice to rolls, force the GM to retarget, and of course, cheat death. Combat is likewise managed similarly, with a few minor twists. First, instead of Limelight as Blade designed it, it operates on three phases where characters out of melee may act, and three bouts for those in melee. Phase 1 recovers the combat pool used in maneuvers, Phase 2 has the melee characters act, and Phase 3 has various checks made outside of that. Bouts follow a similar three-step dance, with the first determining action order, locking or disengagement, and then a new round. Action order in bouts is based on three stances, or orientations, that determine who has initiative during the bout, similar to the aggressor-defender setup in Blade. Initiative determines who uses an offensive or defensive maneuver in the bout. Maneuvers work similarly in Blade, in that you allocate your combat pool to them, and Reach similarly modifies maneuver costs. Damage works largely the same, but an attack's hit location in this case is a d10 roll based on whether your attack is a swing, thrust, or missile attack. You cannot spend combat dice to alter the roll. There are hints of a magic system, but since that's in a separate book that's still unreleased, I can't cover it here. That said, the lack of its presence, and the inclusion of prosthetics, as well as how it presents itself is not only more approachable and organized, but it's clearly not designed for one particular era. The way turn order is described is a little roundabout, and I think that D12 has a better range of probability, but overall I appreciate the efforts made to have it as approachable and clear as possible. Before I get into my final thoughts, I want to state for the record that both games are not bad. In fact, they'd get the stamp of recommended, but the devil is in the details. Blade of the Iron Throne and Song of Swords provide a demonstration in how presentation can affect a game's impression. Both of these tread similar ground, but the former is far more interested in focusing on swords and sorcery, while the latter doesn't have a preferred time period, instead aiming for a broad brush between fantastic and historical, depending on what the GM wants. In a way, similar to Fantasy Craft, a game that we'll be getting into in the future. Blade of the Iron Throne's biggest drawback, if I haven't made it clear by now, is presentation. 
the latter looks far more professional in art, typography, and organization. Now, that's not to say Blade is bad per se, but Blade comes off like a fan work, whereas, whereas Song of Swords looks to be a far less rough of a approach. I would be willing to run both, but personally, if you had to pin me to a wall and make me pick one, I'm going with Song of Swords. That one has stronger potential for customizing the brand of fantasy you want to use, instead of solely emulating the works of Robert E. Howard. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I don't like being a one-trick pony. Stay frosty.